Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we'll bring you day 323 of Russian invasion into Ukraine. The unusual conversational format between Alexei Rostovich, advisor to the office of the president of Ukraine, the lieutenant colonel, and Mark Fagan, Russian opposition politician. Enjoy. Dear friends, glad to see you all on Fagan Live. It is Thursday, January 12th. Five minutes past ten in Kiev, and fast, uh, five minutes past eleven p.m. in Moscow. We're doing another stream day. Let me check. Uh, Three hundred and twenty-three with Alexei Rostovich. Alexei, good evening. Good evening, Mark. We have hundred and thirty-five thousands watching us live. Twenty-six thousands of you click the like button. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on this. Uh, stream please continue sharing links and subscribe subscribing to Fagin live um, to Alexei Rostovich and of course if you are listening or watching that in English subscribe to the privateer station and click the like button that really helps okay the last news uh, forward uh, the one that probably is connected with a lot of aspects of this war and we started discussing it in context of General Lapin the day before yesterday. But uh, yesterday it got uh, continuation and uh, Sarovikin was removed to be a vice commanding officer of the operation. And the leading position was assigned to General Gerasimov. So let's, uh, after all these uh, motions and discussions yesterday, sum up this uh, news. What's the main thing? The main thing, Mark, is that ultra-right in Russia got uh, removed from uh, their race for power. Not exactly removed, they stopped. Um, they have three groups there. They have uh, oligarchs with uh, somewhat a liberal whiff around them. Uh, classic uh, Russian bureaucracy and uh, FSB group, and then ultra-right Prigozhin, Kadyrov, uh, Zolotov, that group. And they've been, uh, the right, ultra-rights were marching rather victoriously about, and they were saying that almost a third of the operation is done in Ukraine by these troops. And looking at what they drive, what they fly, uh, that they have tanks and jets, somebody was giving that to them, right? So that's got to be delivered or transferred by Ministry of Defense. And we saw that there is some infighting there, uh, usually not on the highest level, but on the videos that uh, Wagner, people, Wagner troops were posting online, calling the commander of the operation uh, an F-word and uh, just a whole list of other uh, slurs uh, in his direction. And then we ran into a situation with Solidar when Prigozhin channels and his people were announcing that we've taken Solidar. And Minister of Defense said, nope, you didn't take shit, nothing. It's just blocked and you're still storming it and we don't know if we will and when we will. But uh, your reports about taking Solidar were, were very exaggerated. So, when in Ukraine, representatives of higher political uh, positions give different estimates of the unfolding events, that appears rather normal. We have uh, democracy, we have traditional floor of anarchy in our country. And in Russia, when the same thing happens, it means that they have a very difficult phase of uh, inner fighting. If they cannot agree about whether they have captured or not a regional center, and then Ministry of Defense follows Prigozhin and says, basically undercuts everything that they mentioned, it uh, bring it back to their uh, Prigozhin's language of uh, inmates. Uh, you talk too much. You do not say, basically, Minister of Defense comes out and says, yeah, don't trust him. He, he just... Uh, blabs and uh, there's no truth in his statements and he needed to respond in some way people were waiting according to the rules of their game and 
What do we see? Lapin, who was decimated for so long, who was accused of everything, um, gets a promotion, gets uh, appointed to the commander of the ground operations. Suragikin, who was also leaning towards the ultra-rights, he is being removed to the second positions, which is basically a punishment. Uh, it is a statement that you are an idiot and you failed with the authority given to you. Remember how much they were pumping into him. He is a merciless general who trampled our foes in Syria and he'll do the same thing here in Ukraine and he'll start a real war. And who can remember any achievements uh, by Sorovikin since the, his appointment? Which ones? I don't think there are any, Alexei. Oh yeah, there is one. No. Which one? Name it. Uh, the raccoons stealing from Kherson Zoo, remember that? Oh, hell yeah, this one will go into history, exactly. And this will be a good lesson to those who still believe fairy tales that this guy will come and fix everything. Because the next fairy tale will be about Gerasimov, that he will come and fix everything. That uh, they're starting to say that uh, they appointed him because uh, he is talented, he knows how to do hybrid warfare, he knows how to coordinate different troops, he wrote some training materials on that, and the general tonality in Russian media right now is, we've seen so many changes with, uh, you know, that goes to that funny saying that it doesn't matter how you rearrange the beds in a bordello, the, it stays the same. So, one of the moods in Russian media is uh, about, oh, we don't care, yeah, it doesn't matter what we change, uh, it wouldn't really change the flow, everything will go. Uh, on the West and in Ukraine, remember when they change the general, we often get a splash, oh, there is new blood, there's going to be a lot of changes, there'll be uh, some new developments. Um, in Russia, they're a little more skeptical. And as far as we know, he has given three months, Gerasimov, to act at his current position. I think that's their window, operational window for these 200,000 mobilized that they have to either succeed or utterly fail. Um, so we'll see. But some observers noted that the general command of operation is now done not by Prigozhin and Surovikin and uh, their friend uh, Surovikin, but uh, the guy whom they were publicly defaming. And that guy is in charge. Oh, yeah, 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 Alexei. They called him a fact openly. Yeah, exactly that one. But he is now in charge of supplies, he is now in charge of supplying them ammo supplying equipment and all that so yeah exactly and he will uh, I suspect have issues delivering things on time to them and oh Alexei that's one thing supplies is one thing he can also send them to the place to die right the place of death just go and die there exactly mark and I've read into that many times and I keep bringing it up it's a military wisdom that the earth is round but it has a shape of a suitcase Remember, the ones who have issues with uh, the bosses, with the leadership, there is always a time, there is always a moment in your life when the life and well-being of your bully uh, or somebody who is really giving you a hard time will be in your hands. And that's how it works in, in war. And even the destiny of a brigade uh, commander can be in hands of a platoon commander. That's how war works, it just things happen. And this is uh, another good example of karma working its ways. And I suspect, we haven't seen the confirmation, but I suspect those guys who were in video, uh, who were actively posting things and defaming uh, the general uh, command, they, oh yeah, they're probably dead. I, I don't know if they're dead, but those who were posting that and those who were inspiring them to do that and the commanders of their group in general will suffer some consequences. And in war, there is a very simple way to settle all the grievances. It simplifies things, really. The only price there is death. And people don't realize that when they go to war that it's not just the death of your enemy, but it's also the death of uh, people on your side who, uh, who have conflicts between each other. 
the ultimate price uh, they often pay is death. So here is another thing. We discussed it with Andrei Pankovsky and the others. Uh, I want to bring it up with you. Gerasimov and his generals, they were the ones who were starting that operation back on the 24th of February. There were no Soravikins, uh, butchers of uh, Syria and all that, and uh, Prigorzhans and others. Gerasimov was the command. There was no question of who is commanding what. There was general command, and Gerasimov it was the lead of that command. At least in the open, that was not a discussion. It was a proper answer that general command is uh, planning the operations and planning everything. Right? Mark, who else can do that? Normally, yes, but uh, later they did uh, bring Prigozhin out, they uh, got Kadyrov out. And, Mark, I understand your sentiment, but it's only general command that has specialists who can even run these campaigns. So, um, after, yeah, yeah, I get you, Alexei, that's true. But uh, then there was a conflict between FSB and Minister of Defense, and then they started uh, removing one, putting another bringing other people up to the front. And it's not about who wants to capture more and who get more fame. No, they were basically kicking the blame ball between each other and pointing fingers. And the whole at attempt to bring other figures to the front was to push responsibility away from them. And in essence, Shoigu and Gerasimov, they are part of one big general general's corporation. And they do work together, it's one body of authority, and they have their own style of doing things. And that uh, semi-gangster style of Prigozhin and Kadyrov and others, they are stepping back, taking a back seat now. And for general uh, generals, what's important is everybody else go away. We are the ones in charge, and even if they fail, even if they uh, fail to achieve troops, to achieve their goals with the current troops, they'll still remain in power. It just means that, well, your objectives are unachievable, they're unobtainium for us with the current capacities, and uh, we tried, we honestly failed, but we're still in command. So, summing up your statement, Mark, uh, you correct me if I got you wrong, but basically, after running a circle of 11 months, Putin's uh, government figured out that the government, the country, running a war for almost a year, came to a conclusion that the war should be run as the government. Uh, not as some volunteer uh, gangster Machno style, but... Uh, and, and that probably has more negative uh, consequences and issues, public and logistical and political and others. And then they come to conclusion that it's better to have uh, issues related to dumb general commanding officers they're better than uh, sledgehammering and other things that uh, started popping up on the radar. And it appears that they were scared not by the externalities and consequences of the war that they lost, but I think they were uh, afraid by the inner, by the inside of Russia consequences, by the threats that these uh, additional poles of power and uh, sledgehammers may bring to their destinies. So, that's why the generals are back in command, uh, which, okay, for them it's a good news, I guess. For us, we would appreciate uh, definitely if they had uh, more fighting. Um, Alexei, there is one hope, that these guys, this uh, sledgehammering society, understanding that they're being written off, may actually try to do something. Understanding that they're being removed from power, may try to resist. Oh, that would be a good story for us, Mark. And I, if I had money, I would even pay them to resist. So, yeah, remember how they were accusing Lapin? They've been attacking him in any capacity they could. And uh, the General's Corporation is strong. Apparently, they can even revive his pe their people from dead, from bureaucratic deaths. And they revived Lapin, and they, they're back in command. And Russia is now adhering to military command and their processes. So I want to turn to FSB guys and to all these uh, new power groups. When you 
think you are stronger than the military corporation. You are wrong. You can pick on the single officer, you can scare him, you can uh, decimate his career, you can even kill him, but you cannot destroy the whole general's corporation. Even Stalin with Beria could not destroy their generals. Even those, guys, those political figures uh, of the past failed in doing that. And it is a very bad mistake to underestimate generals at war. You can write things on Telegram channel that Lapin is a bad man. You can publicly accuse him of things and call him names. You can record a video and tell him to go and fight in the trenches. And actually, Lapin himself, just a single general, can be punished and can be sent to fight with a rifle to the front. But as a corporation in a whole, uh, corporation and group of generals, well, is not going anywhere. And even the emperor, and even the, and the, the leader of Russia can uh, be upset at his generals, but then later will come back to his senses and will still appoint things. It's like in the classic movie that uh, well, at first when I gave my proposal to the uh, emperor, he was upset and he tore the piece of paper, but then he thought a bit about it, glued it back together, and uh, everything went forward. So that's exactly what happened there. They, they're gluing it back together and they're getting back to the normal cadence. Uh, good, good point, Alexei, but the thing is that if they succeed, then maybe this uh, inner squabble will stop. But if they will be failing, these processes will continue brewing inside them, these groups. And even though they're failing with the whole war, now they're still trying to push the idea that, look, we're still fighting, we're still big, we'll continue and drag this war to forever. So now you have to go and start negotiating. Exactly right, right, Mark. They want to display the capacity to achieve success on a battlefront. This is the only thing that they're targeting. Because on the background of the losses they suffered in the last four months, they did not have any victories, right? They basically want to show that Russia can concentrate, can find new reserves, new resources, and still go fighting and continue the war. So diplomacy usually follows the flow of war. These, the ones who are not decided, or even the strong ones, the strong sides of the conflict, also do consider what's happening on the battlefront, of course. And uh, battle in, over Solidar, even that victory, which may happen or may not happen, it doesn't really give them any success, right? They don't really take anything major, but it does give them a window to say, well, look, we may be beaten up, we may suck at doing things, but we still can go and wage this war and take your settlements very slowly, we'll waste tens of thousands of people, but we'll continue going doing that. It's basically a dead end, but we'll be doing it regardless until you sit down and negotiate with us. And that's what Turkey starts to bring up. Look, Ukraine is fighting, Russia is fighting, they need to sit down and start negotiating. And that uh, ground operation only exists for that exact purpose, to make Ukraine sit down at the table and of negotiations. But there is a nasty surprise for them. Surprise that Ukraine is not going to negotiate until their troops are on our territory. Uh, they're still hope. They're still hopeful, but uh, nope, won't work. 300,000 are watching us. 125,000 click the like button. We've been live for about 18 minutes. Please continue sharing links and subscribing to Fagin Live to Alexei Rostovich and to the privateer station, if you are watching that in English. Um, okay, let's take a look at that Solidar point. Um, there is so much uh, commentary around it. We can talk about perspectives. It's difficult to predict perspectives here. For now, Ukraine uh, fighters are not leaving Solidar. What's uh, the most important thing that happened? You can see it's semi-surrounded, semi-encircled area on the map, in the middle of it. In Russian society, they have a um, negative uh, flow of data. They basically, that shows that they haven't learned how to think about things in war. And it's, it can be transposed on both sides. In Ukraine, people are looking at uh, in, in Russia, they're, they're fighting their own fight, they're trying to beef up their troops, and Ukraine 
they there are some uh, media that are saying oh they're taking away that settlement which is horrible but guys this is a small uh, 10,000 people settlement and it's our general command who is defining uh, the situation and trying to figure what to do with that situation so what does it mean that we are deciding what to do with that situation it means that we still control that situation we still control what is going on there and we are making decisions what is the best way according to the flow of events what is the best uh, response what is the best strategy and what is the best way for us to behave on this part of the front and uh, we might make a decision to create to do a planned withdrawal and regrouping to new positions so these are planned actions. This is not loss of town when all of a sudden Russian troops came, cut our forces apart. We did not expect, we lost control and we made mistakes and we couldn't leave. No, this is a planned operation. And it's not for beautiful words or reconciliation. Yes, we do face the pressure of the enemy. Yes, there is a threat of encirclement, but everything we do there is planned action. So it is a controlled situation. It's not a summary loss of a town because of some brilliant uh, attacks of the enemy. But Kharkov operation, for example, was a brilliant operation in this regard. They did not expect, they did not plan for it. And I would address uh, Ukrainian media and Russian sources that do not belong to Kremlin towers I would suggest to not uh, treat uh, taken of Solidar as a big uh, achievement of Russian troops and um, do not uh, consider this operation as a loss I would say look at what we are doing we are solving our defense goals and the main goals of defense are what to cause the enemy the maximum of losses and to waste their capacity to for future offensive maneuvers and that's exactly what we're doing we're picking how and where okay so that's with solidar on the other parts of the front anything new there was a lot of uh, shellings and missile strikes they were hitting the rears of Solidar and Bakhmut, that's Konstantinovka and Kramatorsk, and they're hitting the supply lines, they're trying to hit, uh, to, to catch us uh, somewhere grouped with equipment or soldiers. Today, our president also made the announcement in the evening that new means and measures uh, that we receive from our allies, uh, from Western allies, um, a lot of them will be sent to the in the direction of the main fighting. So that's Bakhmut and Solidar. So they will be the first ones to see new equipment. There is a little bit of motion near Marienka as well, and near Avdeevka, but they're small. They're just active trying to trying to attack then uh, near Takmak they're also regrouping continuing their motions maybe they will go in a bit of offensive on the south but there are not too many of them so it doesn't worry us and in Kherson direction there are more artillery duels um, they celebrate killing civilians and we celebrate the hits after which uh, we see two hour detonations and then transports uh, extended transportation of dead and wounded and in the last two days I can just on top of my head remember three of such events and I don't know everything I cannot read all the news coming from the front so overall our general command reported 15 successful attacks by our aviation and uh, very successful ones so we are very active in the air as well they are also moving troops to Militopol and Takmak. Don't think there's uh, the whole 200,000, but they're somewhat slowly regrouping there. And do not forget uh, the direction of Krimina Svatova up in the northeast. There are some evil tongues that are talking about some negative events happening to the north of Kriminaya. Here it is. Um, and they're trying to 
continue pushing towards Zarechna. You see that little protrusion at the bottom, uh, probably towards the bottom. It's more like three or four o'clock. But according to our military reports, they had no success. That's it? Yes, that is it. Well, and, and of course, the usual shellings, they keep attacking our frontline cities, which unfortunately is not uh, big news. It's somewhat routine. Okay. So, in the continuation of what we talked about before, the main topic, today they have announced Kartopolov, the head of uh, Committee of Defense and the in Russian Congress, so he recently announced he, today actually that starting spring, the spring in 2023, they're going to increase the age up until you are eligible to be called upon the army to serve, to be conscribed to the army. So they're increasing it from 27 years to 30 years. And uh, we talked about these possibilities earlier. Initially, they actually used some of the new recruits there, not many, there were some, there were even dead ones and documented ones and captured ones. But right now, what they're doing, they're increasing the age, and there are a lot of people discussing that. So, there, were, yeah, some of their propagandists were saying, what if some of the people in that age bracket just want to go fight, and they can't because legally there is a bracket. So, what can you comment on this? Uh, Mark, they brought this news in three sets. Set one was they stated that the value of the price, the value of life is not too high. What are you talking about, comrades? Then second is why not uh, to bring our new recruits there and new conscripts. And um, the third was, well, we can also convert them into a contract. Just give them a contract and they can continue fighting. And basically, I think they calculated uh, how many people they have of that age bracket for their 140 million people. I think one can see that the general line of thought circles around 200,000 uh, new recruits in any conscription wave. And out of which half of it goes to training camps, about uh, 90,000 on Russian territory, about 10,000 in Belarus. And uh, ha another half goes to plug in the holes in the front. And the new conscript is facing a choice uh, that where he has no say. Will he be sent to training, which may buy him a couple months of extra lifetime uh, on the front, or will he be sent to the grinder immediately? But the central question that matters for those who seriously ponder on this uh, war, will there be the third wave? Will there be the third wave of mobilized? For me, the increase of uh, conscript age basically is a reflection of their thinking process that they are very concerned if they will be able to gather enough from uh, their extraordinary recruitment uh, efforts because they know that they have enough people to call upon to serve in the army uh, you know the usual two-year term and they can say listen we pulled you to the army because you haven't served and you'll be getting what 650 rubles or something oh they're not even paid in the as a, as a two-year uh, service no they're not well maybe you know something to buy a little bit of cigarettes and a couple sandwiches right so they'll be pressing the new recruits to sign a contract and we saw this effort before and they're also reporting that remember on the collegiate event of the higher command of Russian Federation when they were reporting that they're increasing the contract to troops. 
And this is the way to combine, probably. They're trying to combine the group available for them to grow the recruits and to grow the mobilized. Because I think they're afraid that they will not be able to mobilize enough for these 200,000. So they're going to that goal in a two-prong fashion. But uh, conscripts at 30, that's a serious story, right? They may have children and families, right? You know why this story can have that a continuation? Because initially when they discussed uh, the possibility of increasing the age for conscription and mandatory service, and uh, there were some pushback from the government and saying, no, we're not doing that, we, we're not even f considering it. And now Piskov comes out and says, are all these uh, things and questions about increasing the age of mandatory service? Uh, that's the prerogative of defense ministry. Just go there with all these questions. And the Minister of Defense will, of course, say, well, we need that. And by the way, you know why they're increasing it? It looks uh, funny. They go, to so they go to school at 7 and then 11 years. Uh, they finish at 18. So they finish at 18, which is uh, 18 to 21. That was the usual age of... Uh, and why they, the lower bracket is 18, because that's when they finish school. That's the lifetime they paint for their kids. Uh, daycare, school, plastic bag. Um, yep, Mark, I agree with you. But they're also the funny part is that uh, how they kick the ball around. They We know who runs things, right? But Peskov comes out and points the finger at Minister of Defense and saying, oh, it's their prerogative, right? Who's the general, who's the main commander in Russia? Of course, it's Putin. So his speaker pointing finger at Minister of Defense, that's funny. Um, here, that whole story. Russia has a very strong vaccination, so to say, after the first Chechen war about using uh, conscripts, mandatory service, uh, servicemen in fight. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was there, like say, I remember that. And even today, mothers, uh, who was meeting these virtual mothers and virtual others, uh, when they, they were shown the first pictures of conscripts who died on the front, that was important for president to come out and plug that hole. And now that topic will maybe come up again. And the way to avoid it, to avoid that pressure, because that's about the only thing that concerns Russian uh, society that uh, do not send the mandatory service uh, recruits, the, the conscripts. Um, so they are creating a system where they will be pushing these uh, people to sign a contract because they'll bait them with uh, higher payments, with more money and uh, possible better conditions and uh, essentially making them semi-volunteer to go to war. But uh, so there's effects, they have some signs of voluntary uh, process, right? So, hey, you signed your contract. Nobody made you sign that. You basically were invited to, and you did. But what you're signing for, you're signing to kill people or to die yourself? For uh, On the plus side for the generalty is a big increase of potential, a uh, ratio increase of uh, army against uh, Wagner, against Kadyrov, and uh, against uh, Russian Guard or military police, uh, somewhat, uh, internal troops. So this creates a situation where all these three other power groups can become much weaker than the army. And this is the last, this is not the last uh, arrow in the quiver of Ministry of Defense. They're just literally increasing their weight, counted in uh, manpower, in live kilos. Because there are too many Wagners, too many Kadyrovs and others, and they're all friendly to each other, presenting themselves as a single group. Uh, so the army is uh, catching up. They're finding a way to weigh more. We have about 390,000 watching us. Uh, over 150,000 click the like button. We've been live for 34 minutes. Um, next question. I'm um, just bring up what... Goes out. We Konoshenkov already made a statement today. The spokesperson for Russian Defense Minister that uh, he, he made a statement that he destroyed four Bradleys. There are no Bradleys in Ukraine, right? 
Right, Mark. They also took two Bakhmuts, uh, four Solidars, captured three Zelenskis. That's exactly what he said. We destroyed four Bradleys. I'm, I was speechless. I actually listened and rewinded and I was curious. I don't know if he takes a grenade and, you know, I, I don't know, Shahid belt and jumps under them. Uh, I don't know where he finds them because they're not in Ukraine yet. Um, so today there were messages after a statement by Andrzej Duda, president of Poland, about Leopard tanks. Uh, Finland and Britain are also saying, and Finland says, we don't have many, but we'll give them. And so on the verge of Rump next Rammstein meeting, I don't know if uh, they'll discuss airplanes and jets, but as we understand, tanks are already being aggregated into the Ukraine's uh, battle capacity, right? What are we talking about? Is it 10, 20? Mark, there'll be a lot of them. Uh, of course, lesser than we would want to, but definitely more than Slavyov and Konoshenkov would want us to have. Oh no, Konoshenkov already destroyed everything. He'll have to destroy all the new supplies again. He'll just report on that. That's easy for him. Well, he'll have to open his mouth and make sounds. Oh, come on. He's a major general? No, he's lieutenant general. He was major general. No, no, no. He's the lieutenant general now. He's been promoted. He can actually grow to the general of an army at the end of it. So you think at the Rammstein meeting we can hear some new decisions about weapons transfer? I don't know. I'm actually curious what will come of it, because it will show how the West considers the next half a year of this war. And uh, do they think it's uh, offensive, defensive? What's the ratio between one and the other? But And also, what's the share of uh, air defense versus uh, ground armor? But in general, I understand where it goes to. Um, there's definitely a vector of armored vehicles, and that cannot uh, not make us happy, because it appears that, in general, they understand the war in unison with how we understand that. Because the army needs to be very effective in defense and has uh, must also have offensive capability, which is good. If we could multiply by three what they're giving, that would be even amazing. Uh, but, um, you know, still good. So, okay, okay, thank you, Alexei. Uh, Condoleezza Rice today ex-Secretary uh, of State of the United States said that Putin should not be given a breather and the uh, weapons supplies to Ukraine need to be increased urgently. Washington Post published this open letter written by uh, Robert Gates and Condoleezza Rice, according to BBC. In their appeal, uh, they asked the government of the United States to provide more military aid to Ukraine and referring to their personal knowledge of Putin, they are stating that a Russian leader is trying to prolong that war to wear out Ukraine and wear out Ukrainian allies. That means that every delays in military support to Ukraine basically benefit Moscow. Of course, the war continues and the economy of Russia will suffer a decline and uh, people of Russia will suffer economic deprivations, but they're rather used to these things. But for the career of Putin, the defeat of Russian troops in Ukraine is unacceptable and he is eager to wait and spend more people on the front. And Moscow will do everything to hold at least uh, the current positions they have and perhaps refresh and start anew with their offensive at some point later. Just like it happened before, actually, the second phase of war happened eight years after the initial operation of capturing Crimea and Donbass. And uh, in the meantime, Ukrainian troops uh, pushed back and are brilliant in defending their country from Russian invaders. However, their economy is in shambles and uh, many mines cannot be used because of their, their battlefronts and it's difficult to conduct economic operations in a country that is fighting a large-scale war. But the war uh, is slowing down and there is increasing pressure on Kiev to sit down at the table of negotiations. 
and in current circumstances any agreement to sign a peace treaty will leave Russia a strong position to reignite the offensive when they will be ready to do so, which is unacceptable as uh, signed by Condoleezza and uh, Bob Gates. So one is uh, ex-Minister of Defense, another is ex-Secretary uh, of State, very serious people. So they, as the others, remember there was another uh, Atlantic Council message, McFall was also talking about Atticons. There are a lot of voices urging Biden's administration to transfer more weapons. And this question is being posted rather sharply, right on the verge of Rammstein. It is important to give these uh, weapons that Ukraine was asking for. What for? Uh, is it for counteroffensive, for offensive? Is it what uh, can be deduced from it, that uh, your activities that you will carry out after Moscow exhausts itself? Right, we first have to still destroy the offending parties, uh, offending troops, and stop their operations, and then go into our own operations. And it's good that on the West they understand these things. Condoleezza Rice was always a very brilliant specialist. By the way, she knows Russian. Right, she was a Sovietologist. Mm -hmm. She studied, yeah, that was her specialty. They did mention on purpose that they know Putin personally. They have their corresponding personal experience of dealing with him. And there's, in essence, uh, supporting that position that all the Ukrainian experts, the head of our defense, the Zelensky himself, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, all of our team are saying that, including uh, myself. These are obvious things, and it's good to hear more voices joining that position. At the beginning of war, we did differ a lot with the Western ex between our Western experts and ourselves, and uh, I'm glad we are talking the same tune now. And I know that we'll be getting more equipment, more assortment, but we still are getting fewer than we need, and way less than we would want to, but still we'll have them. So, willy-nilly, jokingly, and other waysly, we'll continue doing our operations and we'll win over the invaders, but just may take a little longer. Okay, so one last thing. We have about 400,000 uh, watching us, over 100,000. Click the like button, please continue sharing links to that stream so those who didn't join us live can watch, them late, can watch it later. It is super important. Um, and I got sent this thing that's unexpected story. Girkin. You know that guy, right? Igor Ivanovich Girkin. Right? That exactly one. He, for some reason, calls himself Strelkov. Invented his last name to be more fancier. But I could, I could also invent something fancy, like Valois. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I could, you know. Um, so he's saying that he can debate the enemy. I don't know why he decided that uh, that anybody will talk to him. Did he, did he says that he, refu he would refuse to talk to Aristovich. Uh, what happened? What's, what's going on there? Oh, Alisa Bachman, one of the interviewees, asked me, um, interviewers asked me if... Uh, whom I would talk to. I said I wouldn't talk to Putin, but I mentioned Gherkin said I might. And uh, see, you causing him to now talk. And he is now making a uh, media worthy event of this. So here's the thing if somebody starts talking about you, about uh, me, it means that we are managing them, even not being there. We are in their mind. We are making them think about ourselves, and they basically serve our agenda in this case. So, I'm sorry, Alexei. Excuse me, but the phrase that he doesn't care about unsuccessful discussion that he can discuss things with enemy during war only after the war or before the war. During the war, you need to win and push the enemy to run, capitulate or destroy. 
Mr. Girkin, Igor, you don't understand whom you're talking to. You want to make Alexei to retreat? Go, go to the front and make Alexei retreat. Uh, I actually, Mark thought he was probably a bit of a higher opinion of him, but apparently he is definitely there to earn some personal points. So there are different ways, different things to look for in the communication. You can, of course, go talk to people because you like to be in the limelight, you want to trample on your enemies, or you can look for some truths. Me, as an intel officer, I would want to talk to these people, and I do like digging into their souls and seeing what and why, what's, what motivates them. That's curious. And he, in turn, apparently wants to win public debate or just not lose them. So it's not the matter of truth, it's a matter of uh, self-respect for him and uh, self-love in this case, but uh, self-appreciation. So yeah, you know, not exactly a worthy opponent. Um, but it's entertaining, right, Mark? Uh, Okay, we've been live for 45 and a half minutes. Uh, thank you, everybody. We'll continue on Saturday. We cannot talk on all the subjects right now. But this is our new method. Alexei suggested we talk every other day. We are doing another experiment. Mark, I have other duties besides being on TV, right? So I have to manage my TV life and the other life. If there'll be something radical happening, of course, we'll meet daily. That's fine. Yeah, exactly. When there is counteroffensive or something. Until then, uh, on Saturday at 10 p.m. Kiev and 10, uh, 11 p.m. Moscow, we'll meet again and discuss more news. There probably will be way more uh, things to talk about in the next uh, two days. Thank you. See you on Saturday, Alexei. Goodbye.